Well, great to be with you at St. Mel's. I see a lot of familiar faces, some not so familiar. We're going to try to do uh, something almost impossible, but we'll do it anyway. We're going to uh, try to synthesize the church's teaching. Uh, I came up with this title because I thought it would catch a lot of attention. How Catholics Read the Bible. There's a method, you know. <laughs> there is. It, most people don't know that. The vast majority of Catholics, even, have no idea whatsoever that there is a specific method to reading sacred scripture. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were created through him, and without him nothing that was created was created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Indeed, the darkness could not, cannot, and will not overcome the light who is Christ himself. This first lecture or conference is on divine revelation itself. Now let me just lay out the format for you. What I'm doing in this little mini-series, How Catholics Read the Bible, uh, I'm giving you the church's foundational contemporary document on this subject. This is one of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council, Dei Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's from the first letter of John. All of this is about union with God. It's a very essential thing to remember what all of this is about. We are not engaging in a merely academic exercise. Some of you might remember when I taught the course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, one of the things that I tried to emphasize, and I'm going to emphasize it once again because it needs emphasis, is that we are not dealing with a something. When we deal with the Word of God, we aren't dealing merely with something. We are dealing with somebody. The Word of God, Jesus. Jesus is the Father's only Word. There's a lot of interest nowadays in reading the Bible, and rightly there should be. After all, it is the Word of God. It has the power to build us up. It has the power to, well, make us who we are, the body of Christ. We have today a crisis. It can be called a crisis of method. The reason that I'm doing this uh, little course, this mini-series, is because there's such a great need for it, and I honestly don't know of anyone else who's done it. You know, I looked around, and I couldn't find any competition. <laughs> None. I, I, I don't, I'm not aware, now I could be, you know, I'm not aware of everything that goes on, but I'm not aware of any widely distributed uh, series, uh, even a little one like this, that I'm going to do on this subject matter, and it is of enormous importance. It's about principles. You know, the old uh, adage really um, is relevant here. Remember that old saying, uh, 
you give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. Now that's what this is about. I'm going to teach you how to fish. You know, I'm an old fisherman. I'm going to teach you how to fish. And I'll tell you, your catch is going to be great. It's going to be so great. The Word of God. You've got to be in love with the Word of God. The Word of God isn't just some kind of a dry thing you find in a book. We've got a crisis today, a real crisis. It's a crisis of method. Uh, there's a methodology that is involved in doing theology the way the Catholic Church does. There's a method, a methodology, proper method, involved in how Catholics read the Bible. In almost any sphere of influence, there is a method. If you want the desired result, there's a method that you go about in order to attain it. If you do it wrong, you're not going to get the desired result. Uh, a lot of people forget, especially in this day and age of great advances in technology, everything seems to change. Uh, we forget that when we uh, are involved with Catholic theology, with Catholic scripture study, we have to remember this is something we've received. This is not something we make up as we go along. Jesus Christ also never intended that eternal truth be determined by a democratic vote. <laughs> Doesn't make a bit of difference. It is what it is, whether a million people like it or not, believe it or not, it's the same. Very often I run into people, even Catholics, who will say, oh, I don't believe that, cavalierly dismissing some essential element of Catholic teaching, imagining that somehow the essential teaching can change throughout the ages. It can. What we're dealing with when we deal with divine revelation, when we deal with the Bible, when we deal with the truth, we are dealing with something which is essentially immutable. You know what that term immutable means, unchangeable. Why is the truth, the word of God in its essence, why is that immutable, unchangeable? Because the truth in its substance is God himself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. A divine person is speaking. I am the way, the truth, and the life. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us all truth that truly is, subsists in him who is the truth, God. You know why God is unchangeable? Because he's perfect. God admits of no change because he is absolute perfection. God's not on the way. God is eternally arrived. We're on the way, right? We're creatures. We're imperfect. We change. God doesn't change. That's a fact. That's an absolute doctrinal fact. St. Peter reminds us of something very important in his second letter. First of all, you must understand this. Always pay attention to words. When, when St. Peter says, first of all, that means it's of primary importance. First of all, you must understand this that no prophecy of Scripture, no assertion found in sacred Scripture, is a matter of one's own interpretation. Listen to the Word of God. That's not a matter of your personal interpretation or mine. Nothing in the Bible, no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Very often I'll run into people and they'll read the Bible and thank God for that and they'll 
say, oh, well, I, it means that, I'll give you an example. I was down in Florida when I began preaching many years ago, and there was a particular minister down there who was using the Bible to justify murdering abortion doctors. Believe it or not, somebody had the audacity to be publicly preaching that homicide, even, was justifiable. He was using the Bible to, to do it. Hey, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But now, abortion is a horrible thing. Don't get me wrong. It's a terrible thing. But there is no way on earth that anybody in their right mind can take the scriptures and use that as a basis for knocking off anybody. We just can't do that. Guess what happened? Two doctors were murdered in Pensacola within two years. There's a method. And you've got to know the method. No mere personal interpretations. The scriptures have as their primary author God. Make no mistake about that. God is the author of the Bible. The primary author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. And unless a person guided by the church is filled with that same Holy Spirit, they will never be able to interpret the word of God. They will remain, I don't care how many university degrees they have, they will remain an outsider and an amateur unless imbued with that same spirit who wrote the sacred scriptures to begin with. Father John Hardin, a great Jesuit scholar of our times who was such a good teacher, for so many people he passed on last year, defined methodology in his uh, modern dictionary of the Catholic faith. He said, methodology or method is either a system of principles and procedures applied to a given study or discipline or the underlying principles that govern a certain activity. Uh, methodology is an essential part of the Christian religion. This is common sense, really. Can you imagine, imagine an engineer, okay, a bridge engineer, who didn't follow the principles, the accepted principles of engineering, physics, mathematics. I'm not driving across his bridge. <laughs> no how. Uh, can you imagine... Uh, an attorney, for instance, who didn't ex accept the principles of law. You know, he said, I'm going to make up my own. And he gets in that courtroom and he's representing you. Guess what the judge is going to do to him and you? He's going to throw you right out. A CPA who doesn't follow generally accepted accounting principles, you know, and goes into his client's office one day and says, Mr. Jones, uh, would you like our accounting principles to show a profit or a loss today? <laughs> right? There's a method in everything. You don't get the method right, the desired outcome is not going to be forthcoming. Right at the outset, let me emphasize something. What we're approaching here in this mini-series, How Catholics Read the Bible. Now look, let, let me make a footnote. Sidebar. This stuff isn't rocket science, okay? You all can get this. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. This is not rocket science. Do not be intimidated by studying your faith. It belongs to you. It's your legacy. It's your inheritance. And it is not so, you know, the wonderful thing about God, our Father, is that he makes these things accessible to us. You know, remember when Jesus rejoiced in, in spirit? He said, oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the learned and the clever, but have revealed them to the merest children. He rejoiced in spirit. That's the truth, the word of God. You can understand this, and you need to understand this. You're going to learn these principles, and you won't have any trouble with it. 
I promise you that. Now, we're dealing here with divine revelation. We're dealing with the Word of God. I thank God for a little gift I have. Now, I have five university degrees, a doctorate in theology, but I have never acquired that uncanny knack that certain scholars seem to have of confusing and complicating people. <laughs> Boy, I thank God for that. That's a great gift. Remember the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen? Remember some of us, we used to watch him on television when I was a kid. Sunday night, we'd watch Bishop Sheen. Life is worth living. You know, he's a, probably the greatest preacher of the 20th century, at least in the English language. When Bishop Sheen was a young priest, having just finished his doctorate, he was a very, very highly educated man, an erudite man, a saintly man. He was teaching a class in London, I believe. It was a class of deacons. And he was holding forth on theandric actions. Now, that's a, a fancy word. It comes from Greek words. Theandric actions. That just means the actions of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And he was holding forth in, you know, words this long as only he could do. He had a way with words. And when he was finished with it, one of the deacons he was teaching came up to him. And he said, oh, Dr. Shin, positively brilliant, positively brilliant. Bishop Sheen said, oh, yeah, what did I say? And he said, well, I don't quite know. <laughs> Bishop Sheen said, neither do I. <laughs> and he vowed he would never do that. Very often, teachers think that their business is to sound so educated that the students have to kind of blink their eyes and say, what did he say? <laughs> that's not intelligent. That's not education. And that's not being a good teacher. Your students, first and foremost, should be able to understand what the heck you're talking about. It's that easy. We're talking here with Catholics. Now, there's a, a very great difference between the way Catholics read the Bible and the way any of the other Christian churches do. Now, I love all of our Christian churches brothers and sisters, and I mean that. I have a lot of good friends who are Baptist pastors, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, and I think very highly of them. Very highly of them. Number one, because they're wonderful people, but number two, they have a great reverence for the Word of God. And, and that makes them special in my book, and they are Christians. I'll often say to one of my Southern Baptist friends, I oh, Pastor, good to see you this morning. You know, I am just so happy you're a member of my church. <laughs> and he'll say, what the heck are you talking about? I ain't no Catholic. <laughs> well, only one church, only one head of the church, Jesus. He only has one church. You're baptized, aren't you? Baptism is what brings us into the church. And they are, almost all of them, they all have valid baptism. The way we approach divine revelation God, our Father, reveals himself to us in the person of his only Son. Okay? That, so that word, divine revelation, like don't, don't blink your eyes and say, huh, what's that? Divine revelation. Divine revelation. God, our Father, revealing himself to us in the person of his only Son. Let me read something to you. It's so beautiful. It's from one of the great saints, one of the great doctors of the Catholic Church, St. John of the Cross. There are 33 doctors of the Church. Only 33, right? In over 2,000 years, there's only 33, thousands of saints, only 33 doctors of the Church. St. John of the Cross, great Carmelite, is one of them. Here's what he has to say. It's very, very illuminating. Listen to him. In giving us his son... His only word, for he possesses no other, he spoke everything to us at once in this sole word. And he has no more to say, because what he spoke before to the prophets in parts, he has now spoken all at once by giving us the all who is his son. Any person questioning God or desiring some vision or revelation 
would be guilty not only of foolish behavior, but also of offending him by not fixing his eyes entirely upon Christ and by living with the desire for some other novelty. God, our Father, spoke but one word in the eternal silences of the Trinity, his only word, Jesus the Lord. Foundational, fundamental, essential, the word of God is the second person of the blessed Trinity, the Father's only Son. Now this is very important. This is going to go right over most people's heads. They're not just say, you know, it's so simple. But don't let this go over your head. It is hard to fall in love with a dead letter. It is hard to fall in love with a few words in a book, no matter how beautiful those words are. But the word of God of which I speak, the authentic word of God, isn't a something. Somebody, a divine somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. Please, if you remember nothing else, remember that. And when you read the Bible, what you're doing is you're learning about Jesus. St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, said, Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And that means the entire scripture. But what about the Old Testament? You mean that speaks of Christ? Absolutely it does. The entire Bible is all about the Word of God. Jesus, the eternal Word of our Heavenly Father. All right. We know that truth has two dimensions to it. An objective and a subjective dimension. Now listen, this is important. Very, very important. It's philosophy, but don't let that scare you. We're all philosophers. You know that? That even if you don't have any formal education, you're a philosopher. Everybody goes by a certain philosophy. And so here's a little bit of philosophy. Two dimensions in truth. The objective dimension and the subjective dimension. What's the object? This is really simple. This is so simple that it reminds me of a joke. <laughs> I tell the same jokes over and over and over. I've been telling the same jokes for 10 years. Somebody said to me, why don't you get some new jokes? <laughs> hmm. Kurt Shermer's been traveling with me for years now, <clears throat> and I, I could actually fit him into this joke. But Bishop Sheen told this joke. He said there was a uh, professor of physics who used to travel around giving lectures all over the country with a chauffeur in a limousine, and the chauffeur said to him, you know, I have listened to you give that lecture day after day and year after year. Uh, you know what? I could give that thing as good as you do. <laughs> and so the professor said, okay, tonight you put on my, my suit, and I'll put your chauffeur uniform on. You give the lecture. I'll sit in the audience. And so the, the chauffeur went up there, and he gave a perfect lecture. Absolutely perfect. Somebody raised their hand, though, and said, well, Professor, that was beautiful, but could you just explain to me how it is that E equals mc squared results in this nuclear fission, whereby this, that? And he looked at them, and he said, What? That's the most elementary, silly, stupid question I've ever heard in my life, and just to prove it, I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> So this is really simple. <laughs> Truth, reality, subjective dimension, objective dimension. The objective dimension is the thing in itself. <clears throat> usually, usually I have a Bible. Imagine that I'm teaching a course on how Catholics read the Bible, and I don't have a Bible with me tonight. I will, I'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> Imagine this was. This, this happens to be the lectionary, which is filled with readings from from the Bible. Now, I can hold this up, and this, whether you believe it or not, like it or not, think so or not, this is a lectionary for Sunday Mass. Now, somebody in the back may say, oh, no, it's not. That is for sure a pepperoni pizza. 
and they may be absolutely sincere in their belief. But just remember, you can be just as sincerely wrong as you are sincerely right. And so it doesn't matter how sincere you are, this in itself is what it is, whether you like it or not or believe it or not. That's the objective dimension of truth. Now, what's the subjective? That's the, the mind perceiving, the individual, the subjective action. All right, my mind. In my mind, I take a look at this, and if my mind, the subject perceiving this thing, comes into conformity with it and says, aha, lectionary. What results? Intellectual truth results. This is called ontological truth. You don't have to remember that word. This means the thing in itself. Okay? That's the objective dimension. Now, this is going to become important later. All right. In God. Now, God himself is the author of all that is. God himself is the truth. God is reality. Now, this is very important. Do you know that a good working definition of insanity is to be out of touch with reality. I will hold that an awful lot of people today are out of touch with God. You might agree with that, right? Looking around, watching the news, or your own experience. A lot of people are out of touch with God. God they're out of touch with reality. Absolutely and objectively speaking, God is the perfectly real. And when you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. You are insane. And we wonder why we have so many insane things in the world. That's why. That's why. God is the truth, objectively speaking. That's where the subject of action and the object are complete conformity. Now, all truth. It truly is, subsists in him who is the truth. The word of God is truth. Jesus said, and says to us now, I am the way, the truth. I am the truth. Jesus, the word of God, is the truth. He is the light which shines in the darkness. Now, the darkness is trying to overcome that light right now. Perhaps more than any other time in history, there is a battle going on between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, the forces of truth and the forces of lies, the forces of life and the forces of death. Good and evil are locked in an immortal combat. The souls of God's little children are the spoils of this victory and this war. Last weekend, I also did a, a new series, a mini-series in Michigan called Immortal Combat. On, it, it was a more in-depth treatment of spiritual warfare. I've done that before in uh, not a, maybe I think three talks I did on it one time. We did that. Uh, people are interested in this. We had a big circus tent on 40 acres. They thought we, this was for leaders, lay leaders. They had so many other people want to come. It was supposed to be 200 people. Then it grew to 500,000, 1,500. They, were, they came from everywhere. I forget, 29 states, I think, they told me. People are interested in this. This is a matter of life or death. Do you really know how to read the Bible? You need to. You need to. You know, when I taught the course on the catechism, I was very edified. We had 2,000 plus people coming to the Sacramento Convention Center one Saturday a month for a whole year back in 1996. Uh, as a result of it, we had Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, uh, Mormons, Protestants of every description come into the Catholic Church enter the Catholic Church as the result of this. I'll never forget a story told me about a Jewish man who had come to listen to the lectures on the catechism. He liked what he heard, and he entered an RCIA program in one of the parishes. And as part of the RCIA um, preparation, uh, I'm, I'm sure it had good points to it, uh, but I can <laughs> tell you one that wasn't so good. 
uh, they would sit around and um, they'd take a passage of the Bible. Now, this is very common. It's done even in the Catholic Church, and it's silly. They'd take a passage, somebody read it, then they'd go around the room, and everybody would say what they thought it meant. Well, they came around the room, and they came to the Jew, and they said, and Saul, what do you think it means? He said, what the heck do you mean? What do I think it means? I came here to find out what you people think it means. <laughs> That's not how you read the Bible as a Catholic. Now, by all means, read it somehow to start with. I'm just glad you pick it up. I'm thankful for that. But there's a method. God knows all things perfectly in knowing himself, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us. In this, we have absolute conformity of knower and object known. In fact, this conformity is identity. Truth is not only thus in the divine mind. God not only has truth, God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. Now, God, our Father, so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but come to everlasting life. Hence, this word, this truth, which is taught in sacred scripture, is not something extrinsic to Christ. It is Christ. Let me give you an example. When, when I taught the catechism course, I, I think the first thing I told some of you, I recognize a lot of you, you were there. There's only one teacher. Remember, Jesus said that, you know. There's only one teacher, one rabbi. One teacher. To the degree that you become one with Jesus, the only teacher you'll be able to teach. To the degree that you become one with the truth, you'll be able to impart the truth. Now, I'm giving you the method here. I'm giving you an essential part of this method, how Catholics read the Bible. First and foremost, conformity. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son reveals the Heavenly Father. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 51, tells us that it pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. His will was that men should have access to the Father through Christ the Word made flesh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and thus become sharers in the divine nature. Let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the worst errors, one of the worst maladies that has fallen upon the house of God. That is taking the study of sacred scripture or theology and reducing it merely to an academic exercise. This is a disaster. The study of sacred scripture should bring you more into unity, into intimacy with Christ. And then Christ in the power of his spirit brings us to the Father. What is all this about? This is about salvation. That's what this is about. This is about the salvation of souls. The word of God has the power to transform us into who we are, the body of Christ. Anything less than that just ain't good enough. In plain English, this is about getting to heaven. Now here's where a lot of the scholars will scoff at my approach. They will. I know it. You know, my greatest gift is in preaching. My greatest gift is that I don't give a fat rat's you-know-what who likes it. <laughs> That's my greatest gift, in case you don't know. 
I don't care if they like it or not. At the end, when the smoke of battle is blown away and time gives way to eternity, at the end, you and I are going to stand before Almighty God and we're going to be one or two things. A winner or a loser. Heaven or hell. That's in your face reality. Now the contemporary mind doesn't quite like that kind of a stark presentation. That's because the contemporary mind is weak in many respects. That is a fact an absolutely irrefutable fact of theology and reality. Listen, at the end, now purgatory is just a brief stop on the way to heaven. Okay? That part of the doctrine of the faith, we believe in purgatory in the Catholic Church, and it's biblical. It's biblical. There are certainly passages in Scripture that relate to it. But purgatory notwithstanding, that's just a final purification. A lot of people say, well, God couldn't have no purgatory, a good God, a merciful God. I'll tell you what, purgatory is the mercy of God. <laughs> because if it wasn't for that, you'd have to be perfect. You know, a lot of us ain't getting in without purgatory. All right. God, who dwells in unapproachable light, wants to communicate his own divine life to the men he freely created. Imagine that. God, who dwells in unapproachable life, wants to communicate his own divine life to us. He wants to make us his adopted children. Very often, somebody will come up to me and say, oh, well, you know, Father, my husband's a good man. You know, he's, a, he's, he's very nice. He's considered. What you really trying to tell me, he don't really go to church. <laughs> you know? Isn't that good enough? If, if, if we had a natural end, it'd be good enough. But I got news for you. We don't have a natural end. We have a supernatural end. And in order to attain a supernatural end, we need supernatural means. That's called sanctifying grace. And so being good old boy isn't good enough. All right. God wants to share his own life with us. I like simple, simple definitions, and it's good that you've got to memorize certain things. You have to know certain things. Sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. You don't have to worry about a more complicated definition than that. If anybody asks you, well, what, what's sanctifying grace? That's a share in divine life. God shares his divine life with us through sanctifying grace. That's what this is all about. God communicates himself to us in many ways. But one of the greatest ways is through his word. A mathematics teacher, an English teacher, a history teacher, what do they teach? They, they teach their subject matter, right? If you teach mathematics, you've got to learn mathematics first, right? And then you teach it. English, whatever, whatever it is, whatever your discipline is. The perfect teacher is Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the teacher. I'm the only teacher. All the rest of you are students. This is a case where the teacher and his subject matter are absolutely one. What did Jesus teach himself? Please, please try to grasp that. What did Jesus teach? He taught himself. What's the word of God? Jesus. What did he teach? He taught himself. When we study the word of God, you know the word, when we say I know, you know that word know, I know you, I know history, I know mathematics, the Semitic sense of that word is very, very enlightening. If you understand the Semitic uh, sense of the word, no. In, in the Old Testament, for, for instance, it might say something like, uh, like with uh, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And Abraham knew his wife. It, it, it talked about intimacy, right? About marital intimacy. That's what we're talking about 
knowing the Word of God. It isn't a mere externalism. It isn't something you know from a distance. It's something that you not only know, but you love and union results. Union between you and the Word, such that the two become one. You recognize the words from marriage. The two become one flesh, it says in the Bible. Husband and wife, when they're married, the two become one flesh. When you study the Word of God, when you read the Word of God, you become one with the Word of God. You've got to do it prayerfully. The two become one. That's what God wants. The whole point of this is becoming one with the one Word of God. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. And the Son is the Word of God. Dave Erbum, which is the document we're studying from Vatican II, there were 16 major documents in the Second Vatican Council. Um, this one is the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. What we're studying here is divine revelation. The Catholic approach is an approach to divine revelation in general. We study the Bible in the context of the broader scheme of divine revelation. Listen to Dave Erbum. Hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith this sacred synod asserts to the words of St. John, who says, We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim, proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Vatican II followed the Council of Trent and Vatican I in teaching on divine revelation. St. Thomas Aquinas said an error in the beginning is an error indeed. You do not want to make an error in principle at the beginning. If you do that, the, the error compounds itself and you get further and further astray from where you want to go. Do not try to read or interpret sacred scripture in a vacuum. Our approach properly speaking, is an approach to divine revelation. We approach the word of God as, the, as it was given to us. Now, a, a common error is to take the position that the word of God is just the Bible. Okay? Uh, now, that is the word of God. Make no mistake about it. The written word of God is definitely, absolutely, the Word of God, and that's what we're going to be primarily talking about. But I'm going, to, I'm going to try to express this to you in the form of an analogy, and it's awfully good analogy. Pay attention to it. Look. It is. It's a real good one. How many gods are there? One. All right. How many persons in God? Three. Three. All right. Divine revelation. Is God's revelation, the one God, right? God's revelation to us, right? God wants to reveal himself to us. Why? He loves us. Remember when you were in love with your husband or your wife? Remember what that was like? You, you can remember back that far. <laughs> if you love somebody, you want to know all about that person, don't you? And, and you want to tell that person about you. There, a, a certain interchange takes place. Even if you don't do it consciously, it happens. There's an interchange. You want to share everything. God's that way. That's divine revelation. God so loves us. He wants to give himself to us. He, union with God... Union with the Most Holy Trinity is the meaning of human life. Do you know why God created us? Yeah, and she, yeah, she knows. Yeah. A lot of us, especially us old people know. I am from the old days. See, I grew up in the old days when we studied the Baltimore Catechism, and I'll tell you what, Sister Mildred drilled that thing into my head. I wouldn't dare show up for school not having learned my catechism lesson. He said, why did God create you? God created me that I might know him and love him and serve him, that I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. 
Do you see how old you are? <laughs> but you remember. We remember those things. And, and listen, that's an important thing to remember. I truly believe that you are among the most intelligent people in the world. At least you know why you're here. <laughs> most people don't. They're clueless. They're clueless. God created us for union with himself. And that's why he revealed himself to us in the person of his only son. All right. Three divine persons in that one God. Now, divine revelation. God, Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus assumes a human nature, becomes like one of us in everything except sin. All right. He walks in Palestine. He gathers his apostles and disciples around him. He teaches them. How does he teach them? Well, he teaches them by preaching. He's a preacher. He teaches them by example. They watched him. You know, they were around him for three years or so, and they watched him. The students watched their master, and, and they learned by watching him. It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself to us that way. What was the result of this revelation of our father to us in the person of his son? The result of it was the sanctification of those who came in contact with the Father's only word. The word, Jesus, has power. You know, this is about power. This is really about power. Power to save your soul. The power to save the souls of those you love. Now, only God can save a soul. I learned that much to my own chagrin shortly after I was ordained. I thought I was going to save the world. <laughs> I quickly found out I couldn't. But God can. God can, and he can do it through us. He chooses to do it through us. He doesn't need us. God could redeem an infinity of worlds just by snapping his divine fingers. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. God chose to assume a human nature. Jesus, the Father's only word, assumed a human nature, the incarnation. He became like one of us in everything except sin. And then he joined us to this great work of redemption. Now, God in the past revealed himself. How did he reveal himself in ancient times? Well, through creation, right? Uh, one of the most uh, ancient ways of God revealed himself, primitive revelation, it can be called, is through creation. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was younger, I used to be a fanatic outdoorsman, uh, fishing and hunting and camping. And I remember once being in the wilderness in Maine, way up in northern Maine, and I was on a hunting trip, and I was with a guide. And we were in a real backwoods area, about 30 miles from the nearest road. We were camping back there, and we came out just about dusk on a plateau overlooking a vast expanse of a hardwood swamp. And the way the sun hit it, it was in the fall, and it was just beautiful, brilliant with color. You know how it is uh, back east and this place in the Midwest, all the colors in the fall? Well, this was brilliant. The sun hit those red and absolutely magnificent yellow. And this friend of mine who was a rough guy, this guy, I mean, he was a backwoodsman, uh, and he wasn't particularly religious at all. That's an understatement. But the beauty and the silence of that moment just stopped us in our tracks. And, and he said, he didn't know what he was saying. He says, I'm a pantheist. Now, a pantheist is one who believes God is, is in everything in nature. Now, God is, but I'm not going to fall down out there and worship the oak tree. That's the difference, okay? The, the pantheist thinks that God is, in fact, you know. My friend said that what he meant was, I've come in contact with God this beauty of nature. That's one of the ways God revealed himself to us primitively, through the beauty of nature, the, the order of nature. Okay? Also, God revealed himself to us through Abraham and the patriarchs and through Moses and the commandments and through the prophets. God revealed himself to, this, to us in that way. 
in ancient times, God revealed himself to us in various, various and many different ways. But then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. The incarnation. That's the fullness of revelation. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. All right. This revelation of our father in the person of his son was for a purpose. It was for the purpose of delivering us from the power of evil. Now, all of the biblical scholarship in the world, and it's a good thing, if it doesn't have as its ultimate end the salvation of souls is an exercise in futility. If we divorce scholarship from the work of redemption, that's silly and a waste of time. And why bother? And so we don't want to do that. Now, God has revealed himself to us. What's our business? Our business is to give the obedience of faith. Why do I believe what God has told me? Why do I believe in what God has revealed to me? Because it's plausible? No. Because it suits my fancy? No. Why? Because of the one who has revealed it. The one who is truth itself. The one who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Do you know what faith is? Now, some of you who were my students in the course on the catechism uh, could jump up right now and just rattle it off. Matter of fact, I know that all of you are most, or anyway, are very good Catholics, and you've studied your catechism. You all have a copy of it, certainly, and it's dog-eared, and the print is worn off. You've used it so much. And so if I ask you the very fundamental and essential question, what is the theological virtue of faith being such great Catholics and good scholars of your faith, why there wouldn't be more than two or three of you in here who couldn't answer it. For the sake of the two or three, <laughs> faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, believe all that Holy Church proposes for our beliefs, belief because, of, because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's faith. That's a very important thing. We're people of faith. This is a religion of faith. God revealed himself to us. We have to give the assent of faith. Now God is the first principle and final end of all things. We can do nothing without God. Listen to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 105. Very important. This is fundamental. This is a beginning of our little mini-series here. God is the author of sacred scripture. Now that's a very fundamental thing, and I know most of you know that, but it needs to be said. God is the author of the Bible. Paragraph 106 of the Catechism. Now God inspired the human authors of the sacred books. To compose the sacred books, God chose certain men who all the while he employed them in this task, made full use of their own faculties and powers, so that though he acted in them and by them, it was as true authors that they consigned to writing whatever he wanted written and nothing more. So who is the author of the Bible? God. And the human authors too. Are they true authors? The human authors. Can they be considered true authors, though? Yes, they can. God chose to do it that way. God's the primary author of the Bible, but he worked through the instrumentality of human beings that he called and, and gave a special charism to. All right? they, they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that what they recorded, what they wrote down, was exactly what God wanted and nothing more and nothing less. So, God and man. We've got a primary author, a secondary author, or an instrumental author in the human author. All right. 107 of the Catechism tells us that the inspired books 
teach the truth. Now, I know that this is child's play for you, and I know that you know that. I don't believe there'd be anybody in here who wouldn't say amen to that. Sure, the inspired books teach the truth. All that the sacred writers affirm, now, listen to this now. This is very important in the light of certain things that have gone on in the last several decades. In scholarship, I'll put it in quotation marks. The inspired books teach the truth. All that the sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit. The books of sacred scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. They teach firmly, faithfully, and without error. That is very important, and we'll see why as we go along. Paragraph 108 of the Catechism goes on to say that the Christian faith, now get that you listen to this one. This one will catch you by surprise. Some people would even fall out of their seat and think it's blasphemy or something. But I'm going to quote to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is a sure norm for teaching the faith in the Holy Father's own words. Still, paragraph 108, Catechism, still the Christian faith is not, quotation marks, a religion of the book. Close quotation. Now that is a rather startling statement. The Christian faith is not a religion of the book. Wow. What, how, could, how could they say that? Well, here's why. Christianity is the religion of the word of God. A word which is not a written and mute word, but the word which is incarnate and living. If the scriptures are not to remain a dead letter... Christ, the eternal word of the living God, must, through the Holy Spirit, open our minds to, uh, to understand the scriptures. You can take even the Bible as holy, inspired, and beautiful it is, as it is. You can take that, and if you're not enlightened by the same spirit who is the author of that holy word, you can take that twist it, turn it, distort it, and destroy it in every way imaginable. And so what is an awfully important part of the method? It's called holiness. It's called holiness. It's called prayer. An awful lot of scholars have made an error in recent times. They've reduced scripture scholarship to a mere empirical science. And it is not. It is much more than that. It has dimensions of that, but it is not merely that. It is something much more. It is the living word of God. The Holy Spirit himself is the only authentic and authoritative interpreter of the word of God, whether written or orally transmitted in the form of sacred tradition. Now, in the next hour, we're going to take a 15-minute break, but in the next hour, we're going to talk about the transmission of divine revelations. We'll take a 15-minute break, and then we'll be back. <laughs>